But I wouldn't trade James Bird for any money in the world. I love it and I won't move. Not like most of the people here, I was born in Chambersburg, so it'll always be our home. And as far as I know, the bird was very, very nice. But today, you can have it. Thank you. No, that wasn't nice, honey. Go ahead. That wasn't very nice. Go ahead. Chambersburg was like growing up in a small town within a city because it was very close-knit, all the neighbors knew everybody, all the kids knew who the grown-ups were, people looked out for everybody's kids, uh, you spent your days outside when the weather permitted. Chambersburg just it had its own identity. It was the Little Italy section of Trenton. It was uh, filled with restaurants and Catholic schools and Catholic churches and you know mom and pop businesses and lots of families. The Italians are number one. The Italians also last. You want me to explain to you? Okay. Yeah, <laughs> you get an Irish person, Polish, Irish, uh, Blacks, um, Puerto Rican, they'll help you in case you need help. And you, the Italians a city, if you need help, if he sees you down, he's going to make sure you stay down. Start from day one. They threw Columbus out, didn't they? Yeah. Malconi, out the door. Vespucci, out the door. All the people that had brains like that, they threw them all out because they were jealous of each other. That's what it is about the Italian. I am proud of the Italian. I was born and raised right on Butler Street. So I was always involved with, you know, the bakery of some sort. It's a slow learning process because it's an art. And I'm not an artist. But you learn it by doing, and then you a little bit of pride, and you got yourself a good, you know, piece of work. And that's how we were brought up, and everything had to be perfect. My grandfather was a stickler for uh, perfect-looking bread. Through the years, you've had your regular customers that just like them and their children that would just come all the time because they've had their christenings here, their weddings here. So we got married, we had our, we had our uh, reception, reception here. here. And that's when we used to have sandwiches. Oh, right? and you throw them across? Yeah, you throw them across. Oh, no. <laughs> it's true. Sometimes I get people over here, they're like, they're like 60 or something. Oh, I used to come over here when I was a little boy. I said, oh, <laughs> you know what I mean? And you get people like that, and it's good. You don't see too many places stay around this long. It's built in 1939. I think the restaurants just kept opening and opening and opening, and we became the restaurant district of Trenton. We, we got, became world-renowned in reality, and uh, so we had movie stars come in when they were playing in New York and come in just for dinner. Everybody had a reason to come to Chambersburg, and I think the Italians really did that on their own for the last hundred years. They had the festival every September, just like New York. And it developed that camaraderie and brought in people from all walks of life for the food, really. I remember when I first came over, I used to go, my grandmother used to send me to the people's houses and uh, to get this, get that. And you walk down the street, Bullard, Mont, Bear, and the only thing you smelled was basil, sauce, uh, meatballs, rejoles. All that kind of sausage, <laughs> all that kind of stuff before 12 o'clock. Sunday gravy Sunday, and, and everybody be outside sweeping. Everybody be yes. cleaning yes. up. Yes. You know, up they, their, their front yard, their front, their student. Everybody be sweeping. 
It was a 24-hour town because of Johnny Roebling. Nobody locked their doors. Everybody was walking around 2 and 3 in the morning, coming to a job, going to a job. Most of the people who lived there were working class, blue-collar people. So they didn't have um, high-powered jobs. They didn't travel a lot. Um, most people there hadn't a co didn't have a college education. Work was work, and family was family, and they worked for their families, and when they came home, they enjoyed their families. Dinner was always on everybody's table, usually included a salad, and, you know, it was a sit-down dinner at all the houses, and, you know, if you were a little kid, you rushed through dinner so you could get back outside, and they'd holler, slow down, slow down, and, but then when you would get done, you would just go outside, and that's where everybody was. I got my gun. Is it all going? Yeah. 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 Yeah, same place. Uh, best tomatoes and squash and our zucchini. This used to be a big giant cherry tree. When I was a kid, the people who lived here used to let us climb up and pick all the cherries we wanted. And this is his yard. I used to this for almost 30 years. I did it with garden with different, uh, two different people. Coming back to Chambersburg is bittersweet because I see the Chambersburg I grew up in. I still see it. But I can't ignore some of the decay and some of the things that have happened along the way. Yeah, I miss seeing you guys. It's not the same when you walk outside. And there's no neighbors to talk to. You knock on the door, you know what a cookie? Yeah, so the kids waited for the, the cookies. They could smell when anybody made them. They'd always come out with cookies Ice cream. for the kids. Running up and down the down street, the street on their bicycles. bicycles. Yeah. Draw them on the sidewalk. The neighborhood started changing the most when people started moving out and other people started moving in. And I don't mean to make something a like a color commentary or a racial thing, but it just so happened to be that when all the Italians moved out and a lot of like immigrants, Spanish immigrants and blacks moved in, everything went. When you're thinking about why, why did the neighborhood change so much, you have a very easily understood reason why color, skin color. Anyone you talk to, whether they like to admit it or not, we all know. We all know why the neighborhood went. And I'm not a racist myself. I, I mean, I, I'm not at all whatsoever. If I was, I wouldn't be able to work where I work because this is one of the most racially diverse places I've ever been. And that's only happened recently, but talking about from the time I was 10 and it started changing the most was even before that it started changing so you got to think about how these older um, like the generations above me look at it compared to how when they were young to now because when I was young to now it changed I don't mind the new people coming in neither do I what I mind is that they don't take pride in the neighborhood they destroy the houses they're like a cancer they yeah. move in, and before you know it, it's being eaten away. Yeah, you're right. Okay? They don't have no pride. They leave screen doors open, windows open. They hang out the windows. <laughs> Garbage buckets on the porch, in front of the porch. Garbage in the street. If you wanted to live like that, stay where you came from. Don't come here and destroy this, this country. Although I've only lived here for the last eight years, I've been in and out of this neighborhood for 20 years. Um, you know, I started in the late 80s, and at that time, uh, it was still predominantly Italian Americans, but mostly older people. A lot of people who may have started in Chambersburg, um, you know, started making a lot more money and started looking towards the suburbs. And you had a lot of young families who were moving into bigger houses with a little bit more property and bigger yards. And you had a lot of the senior citizens who, as they were starting to die, their family members were selling the houses. And a lot of the houses were bought by landlords, you know, people who wanted to just buy a lot of properties and rent them out. Unfortunately, when that happens, you don't have home ownership, so you have a lot of people who don't take as much pride in their home. Not all renters, uh, but you know there are occasions where 
you know, when you're not the person who owns the property, you're not as inclined to take care of it or to get to know people. I want to let them know well, we can say, if we got people living in, in, in these houses they are renting, you are welcome to the bird. This is a nice, peaceful uh, place. The neighborhood watch for one another one, you know, we take care of our yard. If you come with loud noise in the morning or loud noise at 12 o'clock, nothing, it got to stop. So I, I can put my, my face up there, you know, but I got babies. I'm a foster parent, you know. I don't want to be doing it. To me, and watching the street, it seems like it's on me all the time. The, 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 there's a special already known who in Eddie's hour, we you know, Eddie Sanchez, you know what I mean? So one of these days what's going to happen is I'm going to come from work and everything, window be broken and busted and everything, but if we get the chance where we know where they live at and just give me the letters and I can send them to them and everything, I know that we can take care of the issue so where they can read it. Well, so, so he makes a good point about, about these neighbors who are renters for people like us who live in the neighborhood and six o'clock in the morning, they pull up in a van, they stand on the horn, and four or five Spanish guys come lay, come running out of the house after five minutes of laying on the horn at six o'clock in the morning. As a community affairs officer, I'm like a special assistant to Lieutenant Cruz, the commander, and you come to me if you have a problem that's not getting resolved. What I've gathered from what they do is a bunch of pointless things. For example, they might decide to put a couple of street lights up on the street to make it look nice. That does nothing for the, as far as I'm concerned, and I've been here my whole life, and a lot of those people I don't think have been here their whole lives. And what that does is just lights up the street. That doesn't, that doesn't get inside of people. That doesn't make people want to form a community anymore. Not from what I've noticed. My father and a couple of my relatives that still live around here could not care less if there's nice looking street lights in front of their house. You know, it's well established, you know, that back in what they, you know, was supposed to be the good old days, that Chambersburg was a homogenous, xenophobic, racist little village. Okay? It's, it had a lot of charm in a certain way, but only if you were within the group. That's the way it was. Now it's, uh, it's, it's a really diverse neighborhood. Diversity 80 years ago was what region of Italy were from, you know, and then there were the Hungarians and the Germans and the Irish, but they were moving out from the 1890s. When the Italians started coming in, they started bolting. Yeah, we took it over from the Germans, right? And uh, they were a pretty close-knit neighborhood, but once they left, Italians moved in. And I'm sure they may have looked at the Italians like, oh, there goes trouble, here comes the mob. I'm sure that, I don't know, I'm sure that was the thought process back then, right? I came here, it used to be, a lot of more people, Italians, white people, they all run away. Maybe because of us, maybe because different kind of people came here and they're afraid of us. I just saw some like rejection in the beginning. For example, when I came here, they broke my windows. They, people were coming, like we, we were painting outside and they were saying, oh, horrible, horrible, or something like uh, racist, you know? So that there, you know, you can tell that right away, you know, that you're not welcome or you know, accepted it, or, you know. That's, that's what I saw and what, what I did experience here. I think there are some people who have a real tough time with diversity of color and religion and um, culture. I think it's a very common thing in, in this area of the country uh, when you see a, an ethnic neighborhood that it transitions from one group to another. Interestingly, it's not just one group of folks in Chambersburg of Latinos. It's not like everybody is from Mexico or everybody is from, you know, Dominican Republic. Chambersburg has always been an area where newly arrived immigrants have been there. And it's because they are, it's a neighborhood type of, uh, it's not 
not like downtown, there's always been small shops. So small shops have always given the newly arrived immigrants an opportunity to open businesses. It's sad not to see uh, some of the Italian restaurants in Chambersburg. I mean, uh, it's um, because, again, the food was excellent. Many of them have moved out to the township. But at the same time, it's really nice to see some of the new immigrants becoming more prosperous and beginning to, to, to make some real um, strides in, in, in economic development in their particular area. So that, that, that's exciting. Most of the small stores are operated by Spanish-speaking people, and most of the restaurants now including some that were operating when I came here as Italian restaurants and others that had been shuttered for a long time have reopened across the board. All the new ones are from Latin American owners. By the time that we, we closed the, the, the deal that we were doing with them, they start crying when they just, you know, passed the, the keys to us. Because it was for a long time, it was such a great time that they used to have here. But it's very hard for them. It's a big diversity what we have here, you know, regarding different different countries, different cultures. So we're, we're doing a little bit of everything, especially to have, you know, those communities happy. You don't realize it, but sometimes it, you're just having a drink with, with all of them and you start looking and say, oh, this is Ecuadorian, oh, this is Guatemala, and this guy is from El Salvador, or, or totally different places far away from, from your own country. And you say, I never thought this would be possible in my life. But this is great. I mean, I feel great. Pan-ethnicity is the idea that different groups, when they are in the context of a larger group, start to identify with each other, even though in another context they would not. So the whole idea of, say, a Latino, like what is a Latino? Well, a Mexican-American or a Mexican immigrant or and a Peruvian, what do they have in common? Well, not very much, except for the language, but put them in a neighborhood, in, in, in Chambersburg, for example, and all of a sudden they have a lot in common because they are, they consider themselves Latino, which is a larger uh, group. The people that come from Central America are more humble compared to the people from South America. Like the Central American countries are a little bit more behind from South America. Most people that come from South America are more professionals. They're people that already have a good living and they want a better living and they come here. For Central America, it's a lot of very uh, people from, from small towns, rural areas. So they come here and they have the responsibility of making themselves come up and also they have to take care of their families. So that's why they have to send back. It's a little bit harder for the Central Americans to be able to process legal documentation for it to the South Americans because of the wars in South America, the Colombians, so the people are put, able to put, uh, ask for political asylum. Compared to Central America, where there's been peace since the late 80s, so it's a little bit harder for them to ask for political asylum, so that's why a lot of people come here um, the illegal way. Now, this is the way many people want to I think that people have two ideas. The Latinos that they know are usually fine. The Latinos that they know, that they personally know, are hardworking and very good, very good people. I hear this over and over. Oh, but he's a very, or she's a very hard worker, very good person. So that's on one level. However, on another level, 
those Latinos, the ones that nobody knows that somehow this, this undifferentiated mass of people, they're, they're a threat. Siento en este país que estamos, o sea, como se dice, perseguidos por, por la ley de este país, por lo que hablaré yo de mi persona y muchos amigos, antes de los llegadores podíamos tener licencia para poder trabajar. Y ahora, si no tenemos los papeles en este país, no puede renovar la licencia. Y sentimos que estamos presionados porque la licencia es una base que se va a poder movilizar para el trabajo y si uno se tiene familia, es muy necesario porque a veces los niños son muy delicados, ¿no? cuando uno necesita ir al hospital, yo no sé. A veces se decepciona uno, mucha presión de, oye, que agarraron tales personas por allá, por allá, por allá. Y, o a veces llega la, la migración en los trabajos también. The largest group of people come here because they want to be able to work legally, and they can't. And so I have the unpleasant task of telling them that under current immigration law, there's no way that they can do that. Do you have hope that things will be better? I don't think so, Roberto. No, I don't think so, the truth. Because it's been so long that it's like this, and it doesn't change anything. Instead of that, it's going to be better. On the contrary, it's going to be like the Cangrejos, going back and forth. Because it's not. Okay. It's the reality. A lot of these people work uh, in uh, probably pizzerias and other restaurants and they close by 10. By, by the time they go home and get ready, it's 10, 30 or 11 and that's when this place really comes alive. We do like music uh, and singing and a lot of people like that, dancing, singing and karaoke. <laughs> getting a significant amount of calls from these cabaret type bars, okay? Some of them were some of them were formerly fine dining establishments where you know people could tolerate whatever noise came out of them, which was minimal at that time. But now they've turned into cabarets and there's a lot of complaints about quality of life issues, coming out drunk and disorderly, and what have you. So we, we do have ways of addressing them. Please bring that to my attention, okay? And I promise you that I'll, I'll get on it and we'll take care of it. This past weekend, we had uh, a fight that occurred. We had another car that went into the building a van 50 feet from my house. Okay. We're talk, folks, we're talking about the area of your palace lounge, right? On Morris Avenue. Yes, and the owner just didn't seem to care about it. So we got a lot of young guys here that have come into the country illegally. They work all day. Uh, they're socially isolated outside of their own their own uh, circle of friends, and there's basically just not girls here. They don't they don't live in a normal environment where you know they're going to meet a nice girl, they're going to get married, they're going to settle down instead of being at the you know being at a bar each night. I sympathize with the people that have to put up with that noise. I also had a similar experience when I was really young out of high school. I went up to Alaska to work. A lot of my friends did when they were building the pipeline up there, and I, I understand, you know, far from home, in a totally, you know, different situation. When I was 10 and 12 years old, we were able to sleep on the porch when it was hot. That was our air conditioning. Mm -hmm. We didn't have no fear of sleeping on the porch because nothing well. would happen to you. <laughs> you do it now, you'll never wake up. Somebody will come up and cut your throat. 
or beat the crap out of you. Well, that's all over, Sue. So not I just here. That, that's all over. It's the, because of the people that's that are moving over. in. I think the Italians, like many cultures, suffer from selective memory syndrome. I think the difference today is everything's in, in the newspapers, on TV, we're just kind of getting inundated with it. I think urban areas have had crime all the time, you know. Um, there were certain kinds of crimes and then certain kinds of crimes that just didn't happen. But there were shootings in the street once in a while, but it was always, you know, rival uh, factions of so-called mini Isacom, they were mobster wannabes. They weren't really organized. They weren't in the Cousin Ostra and all that stuff. They were just mini stuff. But they were here and they had a gambling uh, facility, probably one or two on a block. And then, you know, they had the spotter outside. So you had 24 hour security. They knew who was coming, who was going. They knew, but they didn't bother anybody. They didn't bother the local. Some were just, they were all friends. I think 50, 60 years ago, you could just leave your doors open and not have to lock them. I, and I think you could do that in lots of places where today you can't do that even in very well-to-do suburbs. <laughs> so I think it's just a, a, a much larger social issue and not just a Chambersburg issue. But it just wasn't taken out on the average citizen like it is today. The gangs of today just rob anybody. So we were a half a block from Balbuceres, a block and a half from Casa de Luna, where any restaurant patron could have parked their car and be walking from the restaurant. Um, the, the man came up to us, uh, demanded that we stop, and um, when we didn't stop, he put a stranglehold on Peter. Um, Peter made it late, but I want everybody to know, especially Director Bradley, what happened. And um, when I went up to try and, you know, get him away, he knocked me and I went flying and landed on the sidewalk. Now that's one block from my house. Mm -hmm. And this man shot in the arm at Casa de Luna was at 10.40 p.m. I happened to not be home that night, but I would have heard that shotgun a block from my house. Now, when I moved here six years ago, you know, one thing that we always said was that any of the personal crimes were primarily people who, you know, were walking drunk from a bar at 1 a.m., carrying a lot of cash on them, and they were rolled. The only reason that Peter and I were not robbed is that we had nothing. The Spanish people, they, are, they always got money, cash. Why? Because they go and change the check, and they have all the time in their pocket. Again, many of them are vulnerable because they don't have bank accounts, so it, it's been stated that they're walking ATM machines and they kind of gang up on them. Uh, what we see is a lot of times they're set up. They're set up from inside the bar uh, as they're there patronizing the bar. And then the, uh, the perpetrator inside the bar will communicate by cell phone with the perpetrator outside the bar and they'll set them up for a robbery. And what we don't like about that particularly is the fact that a lot of these people get beat down after they get robbed or during the course of the robbery. Sometimes come in and he say, what happened with you? I don't know, two black guys, they hit me and taking my money, my, my chain, my wallet, my, mo my phone, cell phone, everything. Wow. Why you not call the police now? For what? What are they gonna do? Nothing. And later, no, they're gonna go to jail, or they're gonna send me to my country. Because of their undocumented status, and because of the position they feel that they have been um, put in in this particular country, um, that um, they don't have that trust factor with these institutions. Many of them come here, and the institutions, and the organizations, the police, the military have not been their their friend. All of these members, and all of us, we have meetings almost every week. We like to walk to them. Yeah. They're only from 7 to 8.30. We're not, you know, Peter's very strict on ending them at 8.30. And we're not around here at 11 o'clock at night. And, um, you know, I, I don't think that any of us here want to lose this neighborhood. see a vast majority of the immigrant population coming here to get involved in gangs 
and drugs. We don't see that. We see them coming here to get a job because as soon as they get here, they get a job. Well, I like Guatemala. <laughs> it's just not, no jobs like that. We come here and try to make a living, help our families. We provide jobs to the people. Um, like we help them to get jobs, to go to work and everything. We open the office at five in the morning. So the ones be there every day from Monday to Friday, those are the ones that we try to provide more the job because that's, those are the ones that they really want to work. The way that I see it, some of them, they're more responsible to get a job. And some of them, I, they ask me how much is the pay rate. I say, well, the minimum is seven twenty five. dollars They really don't care if they get paid $6. Like today, it was a lady and she and I asked and I told her, well, I got third shift working and um, a job available. She said, it don't matter to me as long as that I get paid. It don't matter if I get paid $6 an hour. I'm willing to take it. Why? Because I need it. I got a kid to support and I need a job. All Spanish people run my facility. There's no more tanks back there other than us that run the production. They run it all. And they're very good at it, and they never ever disappoint you. I mean, there's days they have bad days, but they're always on. They're always on time. They're always here. Rarely call out. You couldn't ask for better. I've had less trouble with them than I did the actual tangs that used to run the. You know, when I first took over. I think they've they've set good examples, in, just by virtue of the fact that they that they work every day. They're not afraid to take uh, the jobs that <clears throat> most people don't want. Uh, cutting grass, uh, washing dishes, uh, you know, working on a on a hot tin roof when it's 85 degrees out. So they come between Panorama and us to get their breakfast, so to speak, uh, wait for their rides. The owners of the pizza places usually show up, pull up, and then one or two or three will get in their vehicles and go to work. And then they're gone by 11, you know, because most pizza places open 12 or so, 11.30. They're usually gone by 11, and it's every day that way. My point is this, you come to this country, you must learn the language. We're not saying you have to do away with what you were taught when you were a child, but learn the English language because nobody gives you anything for nothing. When my parents came over to this country, they had to learn the English language because if they didn't, they got nothing. We've had a few Italians here that will refuse to speak English and they're 85 years old. So it's the same thing. And I grew up with them, so I know. I have Italian ladies that I knew since I was four years old I can't speak to. And they've been here for 85 years. So give me a break. When the one of my daughters is caused, then when the book them apply, You know, if I go to Italy, I'm going to learn. And even if it's just the menu, I'm going to learn. So I don't even push it. I just deal with whatever. And, I, and if I say I can't understand you, you know, un momento, I call somebody from the back, boom, 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 boom. They're going to have to begin to go to school. They're going to have to learn English. But I know that in order for, to be successful, in order to be able to be competitive in this country, I need to, to at least to some degree, assimilate and begin to understand what's going on here recognize the infrastructure of what happens here so that I can benefit and so that I can assist my community. And that's the thing that I'm concerned about within all the Latino communities, that we need to begin to empower ourselves. Okay. This is my country. This is his country, Guatemala. Guatemala. Is it big or little? No, it's big. 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 It's that's good. Mexico is large and Guatemala is a small. Well, recently, there's more and more coming. We have such a long list, we can't take them all in. I had to divide my class in half. I have 31 students, and they don't fit in the room. And uh, they're still sneaking in saying, can we come an extra day and we won't sign? And can we come an extra day? I won't sign, but can I come? They want to get their GED because now, with the whole thing about immigration and reform, they. Uh, won't be allowed to stay unless they know English. And of course, for their dreams for work, their employers are now asking for a diploma. And so they more and more realize it. The longer they live in this country and see our culture, 
that they really want more education, they need it. I have a question. Why do you come here to English class? What? Why do you come to English? What? Because I want to learn more. <laughs> and why do you want to learn more? For help to my, my children. You want to help them? Homework, children, yeah. The homework. And homework. And, uh, and I want to study, I mean, I want to learn more for my job, for, to get another job better. Where do you want to talk in? Dona. Uh, mi trabajo. In your work? work yeah. What do you, what is your work? So I'm working part-time. Mm -hmm. yeah. You work with food? You work outside? Inside? No, inside. So inside? Cleaning. cleaning. I look in job. When I come in there, and the, the secretary say, do you speak in English? I say, no, because a little bit. She say, when do you speak in English a little bit, you have more work. Oh, when you speak a little bit more English. Yeah. You have more yeah. work. They are all very motivated. And that's the beautiful part about teaching them. I trust them, I have confidence in them. Um, they help each other. And so that's the joy of seeing them all making it. Like we want to make it, the people that are born here. People come here looking for that opportunity. The, um, what one would say, the American dream. Um, sometimes the American dream is, is a wonderful one. Sometimes that journey to that dream is very difficult for many immigrants and that many obstacles will be presented. But they're willing to take that challenge because they understand that the next generation is the one that will benefit by the, by the labor that they will endure in the coming years. A veces, como madre primeriza, yo digo, Dios mío, ¿qué hago en esta situación? ¿Qué, qué está pasando? ¿Qué sé yo? La primera vez que se me enfermó con una diarrea y vómitos. Y exactamente, yo decía, Dios mío, ¿no está mi mamá para para preguntarle y no es lo mismo que ella me diga mira cocina esto y hacerle esto a que ella esté aquí exactamente pero también me siento muy feliz de que esté aquí porque aquí es un país donde hay muchas oportunidades para él tenemos como decimos mantener nuestra cultura pero también adaptarnos, adaptarnos a lo que nosotros elegimos porque nosotras madres elegimos venir ellos no Ellos nacieron aquí y van a tener que convivir porque no toda la vida van a vivir en nuestra casa. Exactamente. Tenemos que enseñarles la cultura americana de una manera que cuando ellos estén conviviendo se sientan bien, se sientan cómodos. Cuando no se sientan ajenos al entorno. Preparados estén, van, no van a sentir tanto la discriminación. Maybe we're not going to be able to reach our, our goal, but they will because they already here. You know, so. They don't have those barriers that we are... Uh, We're facing them right now. Like yeah. the language barrier. The new generation is not gonna, it's not gonna face it. I mean, they actually, we have to push them to learn Spanish. And we have to really tell them, you know, the parents sacrifice, our parents sacrifice what they did for us, for this new generation. That's why we like to be involved in the community, because we are gonna be the role model for them. And we want them to keep in the same way, to keep, keep helping the community. And not only the, the Hispanic community. If we, have to, we have to be focused on our Trenton community as a whole. Because we live in Trenton. Because uh, we have to work for Trenton. And because we are Trenton. Somebody wants it, 
Okay, it's, it's right. Okay. But again, I'm 70 years old now. The reason why, if we do leave, that's because you got to go back and forth upstairs for her and me. We're not getting younger, we get older. That is the only reason. Am I right? That's right, because I love my neighbors. She? I love my neighbors now more. Got, I, the people out here are beautiful. Before, and they were Italian. That's what I'm trying to say to you. Like my husband says, the Italians will put you down all the time. They do. Where these people here, now, he had a triple bypass in two or three. I have cancer. The people around here will help us. If I go knock on somebody's door and say, look, I have to go somewhere, can you take me? They will drop what they're doing and take me. Oh, yeah. They have they been very fortunate. The, the people that have moved right in this little area. It's good. They're good. They're good. They are really nice people, thank God. My aunt still lives here. She's 88, 89. Still lives here. And she, you know, she, I can remember her 10 years ago thinking, gee, it's not the same. I think I should move. I go, you do what you want. I test. He's still here. You know what? I have great neighbors. They take care of me. They're just good people. They take, you know, so now she feels comfortable. They're just Spanish. And some are black. She's got a black family who lives across them. She loves them. It's just who they are. It doesn't, you, know, you can't go by racial color. It's the way it is. And I think it works. You just have to be conscious of it and diligent with it and deal with the problems. Not the, you can't generalize. And if it wasn't for the Latin American immigrants that we have here, um, I, would have, I think this neighborhood would be a ghetto. I think we'd have a lot of abandonment. Uh, I think we'd have much higher levels of uh, tenancy instead of home ownership, which is already way out of balance. But I think it would be, it would be uh, much worse. You know, if we didn't have people moving here that are employed, we would have another concentration of poverty in this neighborhood. I think it's positive. I think the Hispanic population shares a lot of the same generalities with the Italians when they came into Chambersburg, which was hardworking. They're extremely hardworking, um, family-oriented, religious, and I think you know they may be the cornerstone of re revitalizing Chambersburg, you know, and revitalizing parts of Trenton that have fallen into decay at this point.